hey, you think you get Saddam? Did you get him yet? <laughs> like he didn't know. And I looked at him, I go, well, it'd be a good Christmas present, wouldn't it? And then one of the team members come back like, fish in the freezer to the top. And Saddam loved fish. And I was like, oh. Uh huh. It looks like Dirty Uncle Fester, right? <laughs> he, he's... That was a good one. You know, the night before, the night before, we had a hit come up in Baghdad. And it was like, hey, it's one of Saddam's keepers. And we've been chasing Saddam for a while. Let me back up. Let me back up to Thanksgiving. Prior to Thanksgiving, uh, I get called in by the Sergeant Major in the talk. And there's some guy in there in civilian clothes with one of those scarves on his neck. You can tell, yo, you're new to Iraq. That's a cool scarf, right? So it's still cool to you. And he's standing there. He's like, hey, Tom, this guy's a uh, Secret Service from Texas. He's one of President Bush's private security when he's at Texas. Um, the president has, is going to dump his security in D.C. He's going to go to Texas for Thanksgiving. And then they're going to take a secret flight over here. And I want your troop to pull protection at, you know, at Biop, the Baghdad International Airport. It's like, okay, <laughs> all right, uh, what do you want me to do? And so guy Tony, who took his own life after that, took me out, showed me everything he wanted to do. Then we brought the teams out, or the team guys out, and he's like, hey, uh, what can I tell him? What can I, because he told me not to tell him it was the president until the last second. So I devised a story that it was Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders coming in to entertain the troops, and we got to protect them. I'm like, hell yeah, I'll do that, right? So they were motivated. We went out to the airport, we practiced our vehicle lineups and everything. So we're out there Thanksgiving night, and you could hear the plane coming in, and we're all waiting on the end of the runway. And all of a sudden, you see Air Force One spiraling down, and they all look over, and I'm like, all right, I think now's a good time to tell you who's coming in. It's not the cheerleaders, I know it's gonna piss you off, but it's the President of the United States. He's gonna come serve some food and talk to the boys. They were pissed. <laughs> they were pissed <laughs> off. But then it, and it picks up, and they're like, all right, this is cool. You know, as soon as we're chasing Air Force One down the runway for no reason other than to catch up with it later, you know? And it, like, why don't we just stay down this end of the runway? We get out. I mean, we really didn't have much to do with it. There was a few Secret Service. Condoleezza Rice was there. I mean, she's a little firecracker. Piled him in, drove him over to the mess tent. We followed him over, surrounded him, and then I'm, I'm not his AIC, but I'm close to him, you know? And we're backstage, and he's going to go talk to the troops someone's talking about. And, you know, who loves you the most, blah, 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 building him up. Because I don't think they knew he was there yet, because it was that surprise visit no one ever knew about. And we're standing backstage, and he's like, all right. Hey, you think you get Saddam? Did you get him yet? <laughs> like he didn't know. And I looked at him, I go, well, it'd be a good Christmas present, wouldn't it? Well, Yeah. That'd be real nice, you know? I think I'll go talk to these boys now. And he took off. And when Secret Service leans over and he goes, did you just promise the President of the United States you'd have Saddam by Christmas? And I go, I hope not. I said, I hope I didn't do that. I hope he didn't take it that way. He goes, you don't say anything to the President unless it's a positive sentence. I said, okay. <laughs> okay. Good to know now, you know? So he rolls out and we roll back and, and then move on a few more, well, about a month or so, you know. Baghdad that night, you get a, get a hit coming in. Hey, one of Saddam's handlers, we think, is coming into town, we think. He's going to be at this house, we think. And then maybe we can find out where Saddam is. And we had guys who were L and O with, you know, other agencies down the street. And I thought, well, they won't, they'll want to be in on this. So I'll go grab him, bring him back. Um, that was the next day. Never mind. We roll up, plan to do the hit. And as we're rolling in, I see some guy walking down the street. I just noticed, you know, black coat, whatever. Walk down the street and went in another gate. I thought, okay. I logged it in, gate color. I don't know why. Went and hit the house. Really nothing there. I'm like, here we go again. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We call it chasing Elvis, right? Never catching Saddam. And then we started taking fire from like far away at the back side of the house. And I thought, why are they, are they trying to draw us in? Uh, why would, you know, why would someone shoot at us with our armored vehicles from that far away? So I said, hey, I sent a team down. I said, there was a guy, went in a gate, told him to call the gate, and, I, and it might have been Chris's team. Chris was on that team, I think. Poured down that street, and I, and I told the story before about they got in, they went in, they cleared the place and found him underneath a bed with a plastic AK, almost killed him. Had they killed him, we wouldn't know where Saddam was, right? But they didn't, so we caught him. But to hear it later, I think somebody met him at the gate and ter scared the shit out of him, like they were trying to get in the gate, and some guy opened the gate and he was standing right there and freaked him out, and so I took in, and, and then everything else was the same after that. But 
They pulled him back, brought him to the target. I'm like, all right, never mind, let's roll on back. I didn't even talk to that guy. It was just uneventful, but we brought him back for suspicious reasons. Because, well, he had the toy AK and he almost got smoked. And why would you have a toy AK, and, you know, underneath a mattress in someone else's house? Took him back, sent him to Balad for the other guys to have, have their way with him. And I went to bed. Everybody went to bed halfway through the day now, you know. Hey, 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 we got a Saddam hit. And I go, yeah, yeah, when don't we have a Saddam hit? I want to finish sleeping. No, 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 it's a good one. Get up. I want to wake everybody up. I go, don't wake anybody up. Let me look at it first before you wake everybody up, you know. Start looking at it, planning it. Yeah, he's pointing out this, a house to crit, this town, a fish farm. He's in a, he's in a bunker. And I'm like, all right, wake the team leaders up, man. Maybe, you know, bring them in here. Woke them up. Everybody gets excited. Wake the teams up. Come up with a plan. There's another troop, you know, up in Decrit. Our area was Baghdad and South and Fallujah and all that. They were Decrit and up in that area. So as we rolled in to link up with them and link up with the 4th ID, they got to choose which target they would hit because that was their area. So they chose the fish farm, the fish camp on the river. And I'm like, okay, we'll take the house in town because that's probably where he's at, right? Roll in with a fourth ID. They surround the town like it's a normal patrol. We roll in behind them. The other guys are rolling into the fish farm. We blow the door open in this house, and I go in. There's like, I don't know, five or six little babies laying on the right in front of the door on the ground. I'm like, like jumping over babies, and none of them, they're all still asleep. And then there's this 90-year-old guy comes stumbling out, put him down on the ground, and then my boss comes in. All right, what's going on? I go, watch your babies. You know, I'm starting moving babies out of the way. And this guy comes out, he's some old, old, old guy. And then one of the team members come back like, fish in the freezer to the top. And Saddam loved fish. And I was like, oh, oh, ho. So we started inter- at, talking to this guy, not interrogating, talking to this guy, and um, finds out he cooks for Saddam. He's his cook, and he knows where he's at. And he starts having a heart attack like they all do when you're going to roll them up, right? Everyone has a heart attack. Or women start having babies. Like, I don't care what you're doing. You're still going with me, right? And I'm on the, on the radio going, hey, listen, I'm going to do a follow-on mission. I'm going to tape or tie this cook to the front of the pander. He's going to point it out, and we're going to go. And they're like, return to base. Like, listen, you don't get it. I'm going to put him up. He's going to point. We're going to drive there. And we're going to get Saddam. He goes, return to base. I was so mad. So mad. I told the guys, you know, I probably cussed him. Hey, he's blowing this whole thing. We're going to ruin it, blah, blah, blah. Roll back to the palace that we were in when we started. Found my boss and I started to chew his ass because I was so mad. And he goes, shut up and come here. I followed him into this room. And it was one of those things where I opened the door and I looked to the left. I'm like, salt and pepper beard out to here with a leaf in it and just standing there handcuffed at a plastic table. And I'm like, he shuts the door and I go, holy shit. (laughs) That's him? He goes, yeah. I go, it looks like dirty Uncle Fester, right? (laughs) He, he apparently spoke a little English and knew who Fester was or, or just didn't like me and spit on me. He spit on Yeah. Saddam spit on yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you do? I imagine myself knocking him out, right? But I looked at him. I said, it's okay. You'll be dead soon. And I just turned and walked out. And my boss came out behind me and I go, damn, that was it? I mean, that's it? That's it, literally it. We had this whole plan. Move him, fly him, put him on an aircraft carrier, you know, so no one can come get him. Everything changed. He went on buyout, stayed in a house, smelled buyout with two tanks right outside of it, you know, and then went on trial. But I remember driving back in the back of the vehicle. Everybody's asleep. I got the sergeant major with me, and, and he's talking to me, and he's just got a smile on his face. Pretty cool we caught him, huh? He goes, no. Nah. I no longer have a retention problem because <laughs> he knew guys were happy. They finally caught somebody. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And then you go home, you go to bed, and the next day someone's, hey, 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 hey. And you know it's not a Saddam hit, but it's next. And that's when it hits you. It doesn't matter, does it? We're all excited we caught Saddam. Hey, we killed bin Laden. Yay. They were both removed from power, really not doing much by the time we got them all anyway. So it's just next. It just never ends. It just keeps going. You're like, so excited, Saddam, Saddam, if we ever caught him, blah, blah, blah. And you catch him, you're like, that's just another dude, isn't it? It's just another dude. And this one's nasty and dirty and living in a hole, you know? Living in a hole in the ground with a lot of money and a lot of cigars. Invincible cigars. (laughs) I got a box of those at home. They're probably dry rotted. 
sitting out. But that was an uneventful capture of a world leader that, a world leader, right? But it's like, here comes next, you know, it never ends. And then you kind of realize this is relentless. You know, <clears throat> when I was interviewing Chris Van Zandt, we took a break and uh, I have one of the original decks of cards, you know, in that cabinet. I think you saw it and he still smokes. You know, he's, we were out back having, oh, having I'm a- Oh, I'm gonna uh, talk to him about that. <laughs> <laughs> we're out back having a chat and um, he had told me, he goes, you know, we got damn near that entire deck of cards every night. And uh, he had said, you know, people ask how many, how many guys we got, you know, during our time over there. And, and uh, I think he thought I could relate to him, but I, I can't. And uh, he just, he's like, I don't even, I have no idea how many yeah. guys we killed over there. I couldn't tell you. And uh, that's a lot of work, man. I can remember, you know, then they had the blacklist. You got the deck of cards, and then you had the blacklist that nobody knew about, you know, and I remember chasing one on BL54, blacklist number 54. Chasing him, chasing him, chasing him. Always got away, always got away, trying to find him, how to find where he goes when he goes away. Finally devised an idea. Um, he liked to frequent the ladies' houses, you know, the red light district type thing in Baghdad, even though they don't believe in that kind of thing. And so a guy slipped up and put a tracker on his car and then forgot about it. Every day a helicopter would pop up at the airport and see what was going on and go back down. Nope, no signal. Another squadron comes in, we pack up, we do the handover, all our stuff's in ISUs and we're ready to go home. All our guns are packed away. Helicopter does this, shh, beep. Hey, beacon just popped out in the middle of the desert. A squadron starts firing up and I go, Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, 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 sir. Everybody unpacked the boxes for going after this asshole, right? Chased him for a long time. I wasn't going to hand it off on the night of. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They pack up. We load our vehicles. We drive out of town, which was the first time I felt good in Iraq. We drove out of town. We started hitting the desert. There's nothing. We stopped to take a break before we rolled into the compound um, and, and hit it. Got out of the vehicle, stretched my legs, and it was fresh air, and it was desert, and it was beautiful. It's not a light in sight, and I thought, this place could be all right without the people, right? It could be all right without the people in it, or at least the, the jerks in it. And I felt good, you know? I felt like we're on our way home. We're going to do this last hit, and oh, God, don't let that be a bad decision, you know? So we rolled in, like, let's roll in hot, like it, you mean it. And we rolled in, there was like eight, nine dudes lined up. We rolled them up, captured them all, not a shot fired. Eight or nine in a row, and I had a picture of who it was. And I acted like I knew what I was doing. I'd go to the first guy, obviously wasn't him. Second guy, I don't know, man. I don't really know, right? Third guy, I'm like, getting closer, I'm like, oh, yeah, call me, you know, call me Sirhan, huh? He's like, no, no, and I showed him the picture, yes. He just, no, no, but he didn't point to anybody. I go to the next guy, no, not him. I go to the next guy, oh, oh yeah, it's Kamis, huh, Kamis Sirhan. He's like, his head dropped and I went, got you. He started to lean forward and, and headbutt me and try to, I don't know, jump on me, his hands were cuffed. I leaned back real quick and just gave him a quick kick and he went flying across the floor. And I go, that's the man, you know? Everybody else we took back, but that was the one we finally caught him on the last day. Our rotation went back, packed our stuff back up, and flew home the next day with a smile on my face. And we finally finished that one. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.